break. So each time that you redo this and add each time, you're basically going to keep just replicating that little middle spot. And eventually you do it so many times and exponentially that literally the only regions you end up with after you do this like 30 times are the little region that you were just copying in between. Because DNA replication can't happen without those primers, and if those primers are the only thing you're feeding in there, that's the only region that you're going to get is the one that you designated here and here. Let's see if I can I draw this a little bit. Go to the whiteboard. So if we've got open DNA, and let's say this is just a piece that we've been amplifying, each time that we add this little piece right here, polymerase shows up, and it's going to add in blue, let's say, new DNA each time. And then each time that we split each of these open, the process just repeats over and over and over and over again. And eventually, you end up with millions of just that little piece of DNA. So technically, do you still have that original piece of DNA? Yeah, somewhere in there, but it's one of like millions now. So now if you want that little piece that you were amplifying, you've got it. Okay, other piece that usually is a follow-up here is how to use a gel to get DNA down. There's kind of some fun chemistry here. Some ingredients, we're gonna use electricity. We're gonna light up some DNA. So what you have to start is a sort of a gel or sort of, yeah, well, it is a gel. A gel is made of little sugars called polysaccharides. These make it hard for DNA to move, but not impossible for it to move. The DNA that you're loading in right here, other key thing in how it moves and what pushes it. So if you load DNA into one of these little spots, these little wells right here, DNA is highly negatively charged. So the forces that are gonna be push and pulling, the gel apparatus is going to have a massive negative charge here. So that is gonna push this way, this DNA. And it's kinda of gonna like wiggle through these sugars right here. And this positive right here, this is saying to like come down here basically. Because remember the positive is attracting the negative. So by using, and this is kind of like, think about like magnets, like two, two magnets against each other, like repel each other, right? That's the negative on negative. Two magnets attracted to each other, that's the positive on the negative at the bottom. So what happens is that smaller pieces or smaller amounts of DNA will go faster. They can slide through the little sugar maze way quicker than the big pieces. So a good way to draw this is kind of like, I know it's kind of an older arcade game, but like kind of that pog game where things will like kind of fly through. So if you have like a little piece of DNA, it's just gonna like fly right through really quick. If you have a giant piece of DNA, see how it kind of has to like pull around here and then like kind of pull around another one to eventually get to the same spot. And if you only do this for a certain amount of time, the slower ones, the bigger ones just move slower. This is the way that we can kind of identify pieces here. So, a little bit of a, like an off review and application. We'll use this in lab next week. So I figured, hey, why not, uh, why not give it a little cover here? And this is all in the key info too. Specifically to this video link to PCR. It's very fun. Again, today's, there's a lot of stuff in today's lecture that's very good if you go into those videos. Of all days, today's the day to go and use those. Okay, sweet. So, just some good considerations. I'm not gonna, I don't, I, I will explicitly say if I put a PCR style question on the exam, I don't have one on there now. I think this is mainly good for final material where like we've already had the lab, for example, and, um, or sorry, yeah, there's no lab next week, there's test next week, even worse. Never mind. sorry. Um, so in this case, this is posted as well. Think about how I could write a question like, oh no, like you had this problem, what's going on? something along those lines, or an easy question for me to write is like, what is not a difference? Or, you know, what is not a similarity between replication and PCR, right? Okay. 
So that's all replication. That's kind of its own thing. You kind of separate that up here. Now comes sort of the, it seems nitty gritty. And I know like up to this point, I've used the pretty small cartoon to be like, hey, DNA copies into an RNA and the RNA becomes a protein and that's a gene. Today and tomorrow, let's see how that actually happens. So to know how this happens is to know how you can change it. Like certain things about transcription translation that we've learned in the last 10 years that are far more important than just regular genes, I'll tell you that much. Everything that you've heard about the word epigenetics or anything that any of you cited in the eugenic post where it's like environment acts on a genome, this is how. Transcription and how much of the gene you make, that's a big deal. Just because you have the gene, you could make zero copies, you could make 100, and that could differ between people. But key concepts here, transcription, you need to produce that RNA. RNA is basically a transition molecule. Its role is limited to just being sort of a messenger. It has very few functions. We will cover a few actual functions of RNA, but it is not something that does a lot of stuff. Its entire role is to get to this point right here with translation. These are the genes, these are the receptors, these are the serotonin receptors, these are the stress receptors we've talked about, these are the enzymes we've talked about, this is everything. This is what makes life kind of roll. This is what does everything. If I'm being biased, transcription is more cool and it's more important. So that's why we'll cover it first. And obviously it's in order, that'd be cool, that'd be weird. Okay. Get to it again, familiar face, and it's again going to be linked in with video. I really like these. Specifically, we do have to get to. So, although we are going to do transcription first, I want to look at this process and see what the end game is, and that is proteins and how they actually fold up. This will never biology will never do a very good job showing what this chemistry looks like. This is C an amino acid. It's got four groups sticking out of a carbon. One of the groups is unique every time. They bind in all these like myriad of ways, like just immense infinity amounts of ways of chemistry to create something. The code that we've been working with up to this point is just the same here, but it's just a little more detail. So everything we're going to see still relies on that triplet code that we've been using the whole time. Dividing things into three. And today, hopefully we'll actually get to see why. But as you can tell, a genome is made up of all these genes, hooray, but it doesn't matter unless you actually activate a few of them, make them into RNA, and that's gonna become protein. DNA is very rarely functional in any case. Uh, this is kind of cool, by the way. Why this code? Don't really know. This is what it is at this point. There's hypotheses, but they're unsustainable to the point that I can't really like take a guessing game on them for you. Okay, so here we are. This cartoon's a little different than the one I've shown before, but kind of like we talked about, DNA will be splitting open to allow this RNA process to come through. It is far more transient and quick than DNA replication. Remember DNA replication, there was a lot of like engineering, there's all these ingredients, things like that. There's only a couple things here. It's usually just helicase and then something called RNA polymerase. I'll write that here. I'll just say RNA pull. So remember DNA polymerase, it lays down DNA chunks. RNA polymerase just copies what RNA is. Now, first things first, though, you'll notice that RNA doesn't have T, has uracil instead, does not have thymine, just has uracil. So anytime you're looking at an answer and it says a T in an RNA, it's wrong. That's why I love the, the note card is that you don't have to memorize that. You can just have that because that does mimic the real world where it's like, you can just look at that, right? Now, RNA still has A's, so any T that was DNA still gonna bind and become an A in the RNA up here, so that's okay. 
the exchange for U and T just in the RNA is the only key difference, at least in the code. And then equally, break this up into triplets. Okay, and each one of these is going to tell us a new amino acid. And remember, this thing's gonna go on for like thousands of amino acids in some gene. And that chemical interaction is really important. Because remember, on these, you've got like all kinds of like carbon chains, fun stuff, like OH groups, right? So each amino acid is a little unique. What that means is that although you spit out a line of amino acids, and I don't necessarily need you to know primary, secondary, tertiary structure, it helps, but it's not. I need you to just know this big picture is the fact that it does become something 3D. The chemistry, chemicals that like to bind to each other in the amino acids will fold on each other and they will find each other. The key idea here is going to be tertiary. It's the fact that a line of amino acids does not stay aligned. It will like basically crunch into a shape. So if you want to imagine that serotonin receptor, when it spits out, it spits out as a line the amino acids in each sequence start binding to one another, folding in a certain way. This is how you end up with something 3D unique. I know my biochems are probably bored out of their minds, sorry. Quaternary is fine. That's just when two proteins come together and make the big like mothership. Um, you also don't really need to do secondary for me. Um, pretty neat but I'm not gonna talk about secondary because we have so little knowledge of how this folds. We'll get into some cool tech that Google in a lab in England figured out on how to predict this, but today we'll just kind of keep it regular. Okay, so yeah, sorry, this is just an example. So enzymes are complicated. They're not just little Pac-Man cartoons. What you're seeing is a space filling model. And those are amino acids in green and they have to fold into the perfect 3D shape to bind just their target, not something else. God forbid they start chewing everything else up, right? Just their target, just in this space, and that's it. And that's why mutation is so important. So each of these, kind of visualizing what an amino acid looks like at the chemistry level in an active site. And that substrate in green must fit perfectly. And a substrate may be positive in certain areas and negatively charged in others. The active site of an enzyme is so exact that the amino acids in that space are exactly matching. And that's why when you mutate something, you can completely just kill off its, its function with one missing thing. So if I kill this amino acid for a different one, and now suddenly this negative charge is gone, and maybe it's like kind of got a bolting chain right there, and substrate's done, that's it. That's how you can kill off a gene with very little, that the exact area can sometimes matter so much to it. Equally, if I change and put a weird amino acid down here, maybe the structure kind of kinks up right there, and that'll ruin everything else in the 3D structure. So this kind of gets into that point about how some mutations are worse than others. Okay. Equally, while this talked about proteins, it's because they're what change everything. Like I've said before, for fun, but now you know why. Scout's genome and a wolf's genome, less than 1% different. How you use it, which proteins you make, and how many of them. Don't tell Scout he's not a wolf. So, three key questions, we'll see these repeated. The wolf and Scout have turned on and off different combos of genes. Scout doesn't turn on her aggressive, like, craziness gene that a wolf likely has, right? Equally, wolves don't turn on all their dopamine, happy genes, the way Scout does, and she just runs around, like, being friends to everybody, right? The which is on and off, how much, the quantity that matters. Lastly, and most complicated, when. When certain genes arrive matters quite a bit. 
and we'll get to see that in the final phase of the class in this element. Specifically, when is a matter of embryo too, not just live. When the when question number three can be very important for <clears throat> an adult organism. The decisions between making a Pomeranian and a wolf are made very much at that embryo level. And by decisions, I'm not, you know, can't actually manipulate that. No amount of genetic engineering is likely going to turn this into this anytime soon, at least in a generation. Okay, now proteins matter, but we have to get there. RNA is the first step, and RNA is one of the main ways that we can control these three questions, mainly on and off, and mainly how much. But quick aside before we actually see that process, why is genetics a required class? Why is it so evil, right? Because everything does this. This whole thing is determined with this quote unquote dogma, but that's a bad way to put it. Most living characterized things have DNA to store their information. RNA is the sort of middleman. Proteins make life happen. And everything does this, save for a virus, but I'm not in the mood for an argument right now. Why does this all happen <clears throat> in everything? What would that mean about the ancestor of your ancestor and that ancestor of that ancestor, right? <laughs> Tom. All right, it's happened one time. That's why, that's the idea. If there was an event where one thing made all life, that one thing's system would thus be everywhere. And that's what we see. There are no other storage molecules the way DNA does. There are no copying molecules like RNA out there, no cousins, and there's nothing like amino acids. Another key feature here is going to be lipids, cells, array. So the cool thing is that nucleotides actually, <clears throat> they actually form pretty nicely spontaneously under the right conditions. Same with amino acids, this being that R group where you can have positive, negative, long chain. The R group is the unique part about amino acids. Equally. <clears throat> Lipids and those little phospholipids that you've learned about in intro, they can form pretty spontaneously too, and sometimes they form bubbles, or cells. So this is what you'll hear sometimes when a meteor strikes Earth, and it's like, oh, we saw amino acids on the meteor. Yeah, happens a lot. And given that this happened one time, I want to say why. There's another role for RNA that doesn't really exist anymore, but DNA is not functional. It's not chemically active. And the reason why is that it's bound, right? DNA is in like safe storage. It's not doing anything. It's not actually binding anything. RNA on the other hand, this is the next feature of it, single stranded. If something is single strand, it can form a 3D shape. All the DNA can do is make a helix, basically. The RNA can form weird structures if you give it the right sequence of nucleotides. You can have regions that can fall on top of each other and actually bind really nicely, for example. You can have regions of RNA that may grab certain important functional chemical groups. what you're looking at right here is something called a ribozyme. All it is is nucleotides. So what the ribozyme could do that no other RNA could do and whatever chance that it took for this to happen was that it can make more ribozymes. What it does is it copies the sequence of itself in a line, basically grabbing down here, 
grab another A, attach it here, let's grab a C, let's attach it here, let's grab a G, let's attach it here, let's say. So it's basically self-replicating. Like I said, RNA today is basically just a copying mechanism, but the fact that it can be a single structure and actually form 3D, life had to begin with RNA, it couldn't have been DNA. So, kind of cool, kind of like a protein, but it can make a 3D shape and do stuff. It's not as functional as a protein because you're only working with four things at a time. It's not very much diversity as far as function. But here's what happens. Fun stuff. This is our hypothesis. It's the best we got, trust me. Nobody was there to see it. First off, nucleotides can form. They're pretty good little chemicals. They may even form a nice chain. What we see here is we find a chain in a 3D shape that assembles itself one more time. Suddenly, you have a chain and you'll have like billions of these little chains assembling themselves. Here would be the next key step is once you have millions of these little self-assembling chains, some of them have mistakes. Some of those mistakes may be able to grab a protein all of a sudden. Amino acids are kind of floating around in this quote unquote soup right now, too. So at this stage, once you harness amino acids, you actually get a lot more diverse function because they're much more, they're much more powerful, I'd say. Once you can start forming chains of proteins, now your functionality goes way up. But it's still not protected. There was some there's some event where lipids were forming these little micelles or bubbles, kind of like what we think of as cell membranes. Eventually, some of these chemicals found home in this thing. And RNA is still running the show and going to protein. The problem with RNA, and this is something to consider with it, and actually, I'll be honest about this, this content, Unless I make it pretty clear, I'm, I'm betting this will be more on the final because it's a heavy application, but still. So RNA is still running the show. RNA is highly unstable. So it makes it a perfect copying molecule, but it's a very bad functional forever molecule because it doesn't last long. It gets chewed up by stuff, it gets attacked. There eventually came a protein that was able to assemble RNA into a double-stranded version of RNA we now call DNA. It was able to like sort of safe store it for later, right? It's much better to be double stranded like that. All your chemistry is not exposed to the world to get chewed on. And once you have a safe storage method, you can work on all kinds of other stuff. This little network that we're in, something called a proto cell, we imagine. And that's what I meant by happening, it happened one time, theoretically, that right combination, right time, and it could replicate itself fully in that first cell. And that was that. That's the idea. When we mimic this environment synthetically in the lab, we can see this occur once in a while. The fact is, this only happened one time, and it did. Kind of incredible so i don't want to take you know science isn't about like ruining mystery it's about like kind of invigorating and seeing what what we can make pretty neat okay now back to real life a little bit dna is the better molecule it's our boy but only rna could have done the functional stuff in the beginning that nice single strand you get all kinds of like 3d shapes Here's why it's reactive. Remember I told you about how OH groups were super reactive? It's got two of them. DNA's only got one. 
equally the only change up here with strands again is that u for t change. That's about it. We will meet certain RNAs that have function. We'll meet this one later. But DNA is safe. DNA's got a backup copy too. You can repair it, it's stable. So although you kind of needed to start with something very fiery and crazy like RNA, life could only really maintain itself at least kind of in that infinite loop or in that infinite like ancestry if it had something to safe store what worked before. So probably should have put transcription translation and some chemistry in there, but I didn't want to scare everybody right after spring break. So now it's over. It's okay. All right, so take a break. And I got the class survey results at least. So, and got a little bit of an explanation for what happened as well. Interesting, but uh, good though. Otherwise, yeah, I haven't pissed all of you off yet. So that's good. Um, you guys want more homework, okay. <laughs> I just, recordings will last longer. Let's put those up something like 48 hours, maybe even Sunday of each week. Cause then all of a sudden it's like, well, like I got my time. I want to review, I've taken my notes. Yeah, I think Sunday's gonna be a good one. Um, yeah, otherwise too, more time to like practice live questions in class. I think what I'll probably end up doing is just bringing in, we'll, we'll do a little trial run today. That's what the papers are for. So text your friends that aren't in class and be like, help. <laughs> um, we're gonna have a couple practices here today. So, okay, take a break, you're good. Um,
right, so now we actually get to kind of hyper in on this process. Storing information in DNA, but actually making it out of, making it into something, it will become something. Trust me, there's a lot of kind of hardcore biology reasons why this middleman change here is actually pretty, pretty helpful. We'll see a couple. Because at first you might be like, why don't the DNA just become protein, right? Why not skip that step? We'll actually see a couple things. Key thing with transcription, why I like it, kind of like those two, three things that we talked about already. Which ones, how much, when? Transcription controls a ton of that question. Although it seems just like a static process, turning the dials on this is realistically how you change an organism, far less so just using CRISPR, like all kinds of crazy stuff like that. CRISPR is cool, but controlling this process, that's how you can really make something different. Okay, first piece. At this point, we are sort of zoomed in on a piece of DNA, right? You'll see all the directions, you'll see that it's double-stranded. This gray thing is RNA polymerase. This is what is going to do the work for us. Before every gene exists a DNA region called a promoter. The role of the promoter is to attract RNA polymerase. Promoter is very good at this job, which is to say, hello, there's a gene here, and you should turn it on. Past the cartoon element here, there's some couple details that I always find helpful. There are two elements here, a TA, TA element, and a, another little like promoter box, minus 35 elements. So they're about 35 and 10 nucleotides away from the beginning of the actual gene that you want. Now remember how I talked about enzymes and active sites, right? The target. RNA polymerase is drawn nicely as a little circle here, but its active sites are these DNA nucleotides. Now I know that's hard to conceptualize sometimes because you always think enzyme like, oh my God, mitochondria. Or active site, oh no. But polymerase finds its way around the genome by finding these little elements. They are its target, essentially. They are how we find this piece. So should I, without actually harming the gene, if I deleted the promoter region, I may as well have erased the gene off the planet, right? If I scrub these two, I scrub this, and thus, I'm never gonna know where the gene was, right? Consider that any time. I'm like, what's the most damaging thing you can do to this thing? Don't just count the fact that if I ruin the promoter, I essentially kill the gene. Okay. This is initiation, it's basically just finding it. Next piece elongation. Polymerase will do the opening. Open. makes RNA, whole thing. So unlike re DNA replication, and one of the cool ways to study some of these processes is put them up in a matrix lined up against each other, find the differences, makes it a lot easier than just taking straight notes sometimes. Or at least it's a way to like make your notes stop. It's different how to be done. So very quickly splits this open. There are no added ingredients, no single stranded binding proteins, just about 10 nucleotides that are open right there. And it unzips and it zips behind it. It's gonna keep going too, and remember this is going from five prime to three prime, just like it says right here. I got a normal golden rule. Another cool thing about RNA and transcription that makes it easier, no primer, open it up. Theorize, you know, green text, blue text wise, because RNA is far more reactive and RNA polymerase is just 
has to make his job a lot quicker. So there's some verbiage here that like, it's pretty important, I can't lie. Template strand means the one that you are actually binding and copying from, right? This is the page of the book that you're copying the text from to the RNA. Always remember to note the direction of this. Everything's always going to run opposite of each other. So if this is going five to three prime above, that means technically this direction is five to three prime down here, right? We see that reflected here. Everything, no matter what, is always anti-parallel. You'll never see strands of nucleotides running the same direction. So, oh, elongation is not bad. It's actually pretty easy just because then it's just going to keep stranding, copying, copying, copying. It's going to keep spitting out this RNA out this, this direction. The other DNA strand that is not being physically used at that time, technically called the coding strand. I know that's confusing. Call it something else if you want. Um, it always bothers me because coding makes it sound like it's doing anything. It's not. The reason it's called a coding strand is that if you look at the template strand first, you look at your RNA, see how these are nice in like different directions, everything's good. These are the links, right? Everything makes sense. The coding strand just happens to look quite a bit like the RNA strand. So notice how where there's a G in the coding strand, there's a G in the RNA. And where there's a C, there's a C. And where there's a T in the DNA, there's a T. Coding strand just it's a mirror image of what you're actually making. It's not really doing anything though, and I would say don't use it as a shortcut. It can make things like far more confusing and worse off, actually. Template strand is your best friend, so long as you can work the system. Everything's gonna be straightforward and no rules really get broken. But a good way to practice this is to be to basically say, like, okay, here's my RNA. Lay it out five prime to three prime, and then say, okay, what was the template DNA then that must be matching on this, right? That must be G, G, C. What was the coding DNA above this template DNA, right? And kind of make sure you're switching the directions up, but make sure that you can see each layer of the, of the puzzle. But broadly, the cool thing with the elongation is RNA polymerase is basically kind of shows up alone, does everything, spits out an RNA, and we're good. So this is meant to be a GIF or GIF, depending on your allegiances, but basically what happens is, this, is in the middle of big old RNA polymerase, you just basically keep adding little RNA nucleotides to this chain. You make a giant RNA. So not too bad. Everything's smooth. Everything makes sense. Okay. Got to eventually end. There's sequences at the end of genes that trigger this terminal ends, basically. So what happens is that kind of like the promoter, where it's like begin here, there is an end here signal, right? The key weirdness about this section of DNA is that it is sort of, it is what we call a palindrome. Palindromes can be read, they're sentences that can be read forward and then backwards as well. So one of the hardest things to make in English. What a palindrome does is that if all these were A's, for example, and I believe, how's it gonna go? All these are T's, for example. Sorry, I'm drawing, I'm drawing the DNA right here. Basically what happens is that, like I told you, RNA can form 3D structures. And terminators are very good at making RNA that are complementary to themselves. So what this means is that when this is copied here, right, DNA, RNA can't have T's, my bad. What terminator loops are, are like very repeated sequences of when you make the RNA and it's kind of spitting out RNA polymerase, it binds on itself. It's very complementary. 
that little loop that forms right there causes a kink, breaks the line. I, yeah, I'd say even like this detail, I mean, I, I need to show you it. It's pretty, it would be pretty hard for me to test. Maybe not impossible, but I'd be like, here's this sequence of tons of A's in the DNA and then like tons of T's. It sequenced an RNA into A's and U's respectively. And then those bind on top of each other. That's the termination. And that little 3D structure is something to this day that's, that's how a gene ends, at least, with, at least with the RNA. Okay, then we've got our RNA. Pretty cool. Not too bad, honestly, right? Same rules as we've been seeing with three to five primes, all that good stuff. Nothing too crazy, hopefully. Knowing that process and then the steps we can take in the final third of this class with epigenetics, all that's gonna be is, how do we make this process go faster? How do we make it more? How do we stop this process? But that's it. Okay, so yeah, use the break to kind of say like, okay, these parts were smooth, these are not, Try and put a picture together with a couple people if you can. I'll also kind of run around a little bit right now. Okay, so let's see. Oops. The one key issue that occurred when we were first able to kind of visualize transcription and the amount of RNA that we made, but then the size of actual genes, we kept seeing that the RNA that we spit out just now, because it is the whole section, thousands of nucleotides long, kept getting trimmed. 
kept being shorter. Genes were not as big as the RNA that comes out as the middleman. We found there was something actually cutting pieces out of the massive RNA. What we found next is that something called exons were left over. Something called introns were cut out and sent to the trash. So what started as a massive, long sequence usually ends in a very like refined, small sequence, basically. Now, this is a bit of a complicated way to do it, but I don't know, if you want to bubble class, it's fine. So, pretty cool little thing called SNRPs, whatever. What they do is they grab the ends of introns. They bring them to something cool sounding called spliceosome, and you can guess what this is about to do. Yeah, somebody just said splice, yeah. Grabs these and cuts them. Notice some of these proteins in purple are complementary, have RNA to bind those regions. Kind of neat. Remember, telomerase had that same sort of thing, right? A union between protein and RNA. Typically going to be seen in a lot of your DNA binding type stuff or RNA binding stuff. So cut these two regions. Get that out of here. Just want to make exons. There's nothing typically functional, you don't want to make protein out of an intron. It is not something functional. It will be a big scrambly mess if you leave it in, if it doesn't ruin your three by three by three order of frame shift, right? You always need to kill these off. Now, seems like a bit of a waste of resources again, right? I go to all this trouble. Why make the whole thing? Why aren't genes just nice and one single unit? Let's imagine a gene here. I'll do my best to color code this kind of nicely. Okay. So let's imagine that the exon region of highlights. The exons are the pieces that can become transcription and translation. They can become a gene. They can become functional, nice 3D protein pieces. All these E1, E2, E3, and E4. In between is an intron for each case, right? And we'll just say intron here, intron here, intron there. Just these are genes. So, looking at things, it makes sense that this gene, this DNA gene that we've made a big RNA fuss over and made this, you could end up with four exons, right? One, two, three, four. Would be enough. That's one option. We're going to have E1, E2, and E3, and E4. They're all slapped together when you cut out each of these regions, right? So again, I ask, what's the functionality of cutting out and chopping out introns? What other exon combinations could I make besides just E1, 2, 3, 4? You don't have to shout it out. Think to yourself. Where could I cut to make a different combination? Each of those little slashes that I've got in the intron region is now a different spot. Your best in your notes, draw out a couple possibilities here. Maybe even just one. Besides the maximum exon region. What 
piece that you cut out and make something new different. Function here is that what if instead of a full length gene, I needed maybe maybe I need a gene that's a little quicker and doesn't have E4, which happens to contain the stop region of this protein, right? Maybe I just have one, two, and three, because when I cut this exon, I cut the whole thing off, right? So I have two versions now, right? Take another look. Maybe I don't want the middle region of this gene. Maybe it's a little slow or something. I just want the regulatory region to kind of patrol. E1 and E4. Cut here, cut here, kill everything in between. Third version of the gene. This is the beginning of why you have 20,000 genes in your DNA, but you have about 120,000 ways to make functional proteins. It's sort of like the multiplier effect that American banks use to capitalize on, you know, money. But we're doing it with genes, so it's fine. So in this case, think about all the genes that have like 18 exons. You can decide all kinds of different regions and ways that you want to trim and shoot and combine. You could make something here, for example, that is missing E2 and missing E4. You have a combo of E1 and E3, for example. Those little exon segments, you can basically kind of like Legos put something unique together from the same piece of DNA. Sometimes even in the same cell, you can make this decision. So this is something called alternative RNA splicing. You end up with the full copy of the DNA gene. This is the first way to, this is the first time I've shown you how the 20,000 genes are not your limit. This book book goes far beyond this. I don't know how good that cake would taste if you ripped out the egg step, but uh, you definitely can. That's sort of how you can make different recipes or different products from the same quote unquote recipe. You can rip pages out. So you can see here is example one, here is example two, for example, right there. You're gonna have different regions kind of stuck in there sometimes. Equally, sometimes these can leave in little tiny regions that are nearly exons. That's what that little purple is right there. But the broad idea is that you can mix and match which exons you want pretty freely. Doesn't mean each one of these combinations is gonna be a functional gene. Plenty of times you need certain exons to happen. It's not a whole menagerie. Well, probably allows you to have about five times more cellular genetic diversity than what would be expected for 20,000 genes. So, pretty sweet. Like I said, there's a lot more to RNA than just being that sort of that middle thing. Its main role is to find and at least start that process, like we've seen. I know this isn't red, my bad, but you may have seen this a million times. But now this one has the step that we just did, RNA processing. But once you process it and you make the exons you want, the entire journey relies on getting to the ribosome and making that final protein step, that's it. I don't think we're gonna get to translation today, which is fine. You will, but 
you'll basically find it's far more uniform. It's kind of one of those dumb things in a cell. It just kind of does what it's told type of thing. Transcriptions are way more, way more dynamic. There's a lot more ways to change what the words do. Now, this is the main role of RNA, but there are a few others. So this is a way for me to ask questions. What is not a role of RNA? And it won't be one of these or the ones that you've seen before. Here's a special case. This kind of deals exactly what we talked about. There are certain genes called microRNAs, silencing RNAs, either way. They make an RNA of themselves, and that RNA happens to bind perfectly as a mirror to a different gene's RNA. And then this RNA right here, this micro one, When this microRNA finds its target, it actually binds this region and like destroys it, blocks it. This is a way to shut down a gene. Can't have any protein. You got your RNA killed in the process. This is a good example, but a you know, somewhat rare example where RNA is the gene. It's the thing that does something. <laughs> Proteins do most of this, but R mRNA is a very cool example of very cool function of how you actually cause something, cause and effect here. This is one of the ways that you can determine the on and off question and the how much question, because this can be a sliding scale. one way to sort of regulate how many genes are made or if they're made at all. Yep. So the other special cases of RNA, as you've seen, is when RNA is kind of plopped in a protein and like uses that to bind everything, kind of like um, lysosomes you just saw, or telomerase, for example, where it fixes the ends of the chromosome. But this is the way that RNA is actually the gene. It's the thing, not just a part of it. Okay. Looking ahead, let's take a look at the three stuff here. We're not going to do any of the machinery today, luckily, but mainly. Before we leave, let's just take a look at this code right here. Like I've shown you before, and I think the examples that are on the practice guide type thing, those will be those images will also be on the exam. You don't need to draw these out for yourself. Mainly, I just always want to show you. There's different changes for which ones are larger physically and charged differently. Okay, so first challenge that we had as far as reading all this was the code itself. We started simple. What is an RNA that's just A, A, A going to be Ever, over and over again, right? Basically, we just saw this kept spitting out lysine. So at least we know somewhere that adenine and RNA must code for lysis, right? We repeated this process with U's, G's, and C's. We kind of started to get a kind of a look at everything. The problem with those repeats was we couldn't quite tell why it was just three codes. If you're looking at here, what we know now is that every RNA always starts with ATG to begin a G happens to be just chemically where the ribosome can actually find, bind it, and start making protein. But a lot of people had a problem with the idea that triplet code, and hence the 
oddly annoying, complicated thing here. What some people thought, so what we know now, let's do what we know now first. What we know now is that three nucleotides are red, the next three are red, the next three are red, and each of those is gonna correspond to an amino acid. People had a problem deciphering at first. Well, if you read that first AGG, is the next one gonna be CGP? You just shift over one at a time. So it took a lot of experimentation and finding that it was the combinations of three that were the key. That was it. There's usually a pretty, pretty decent gimme test question where I say, what is this gonna code for right here? And a couple of the answers will have like six amino acids where there should only be like two or three, because I'm assuming you aren't reading three by three. That's kind of the key here with this reading step that was difficult. But like we saw down here, just go with three each time. What you had, what we had to event, what we were doing eventually was just doing like the same repeat of threes eventually. And we started to figure out that was the way we confirmed that it was three at a time. So like we've seen before, if you have the key info up, keep this, keep this on yourself right now. As far as transcription goes, again, that AUG and the RNA is always going to be what we start with. And this is all red five to three prime. You have to keep that track whenever you see a question and maybe I give it to you not out of, maybe out of order, right? Like I said, you always offer this. This is the same slide, that's why it's blue text. But like we did at the beginning of class, this whole thing's universal. You can pop a jellyfish GFG gene into a fish or a mouse or a cat or a human. It's gonna get read. There's nothing really to tell it not to read. Obviously I'm oversimplifying a very complicated engineering process, but it does work. Because this code is the same in us as it is in a, in a banana, where it is in a sucker. So give this one a shot. That's what a little piece of the scratch here for. Oh no, and I heinously put the five prime at the top here so you can't read it. Sorry, that's five prime, there you go. So we'll end on a couple of these, maybe just this one too. Oh yeah. So starting off pretty straightforward. No trick. I even gave it to you in order, right? Read it off, work together, make sure that you're right. This is the beginning of that practice. Tell me if I'm wrong here. We'll have to know how it works for normal so that when I mutate something, I can see the new result. And this one's a pretty straightforward one. You'll notice on the test, I try to value the more straightforward questions higher, the harder ones a little less. If you get the hard ones, great. I really want you to get the straightforward. You guys will always have this on the exam. You're welcome to write it out if you want, but I guess. Yeah, that was old school genetics, guys. <laughs> it's like, what's a lysine? Ooh, now we don't. So equally, this is a good chance to look at 
how exam questions can be broken away really quickly, save you some time, right? If you find that first one, it's only two options. And if you size up the RNA, it can only be three amino acids, right? The only other way that I made those answers was if you were reading three by three and only using one of them, which is the wrong way. More information is not likely going to be necessary on these ones. Okay, so it feels pretty good. Thumbs up in front of yourself. Feel it? Okay. You got it. If not, you got something to find me for. Not in front of everybody, obviously, but it's kind of on your own. Last one. It's kind of a two-part question, but first one's dealing with how we apply this. Certain amino acids. First one is that certain amino acids are more powerful to change from one another. So I use this chart and say what's going to be the worst change or Google, or Google the, you know, the amino acid. The bonus one is I kind of just wrote this question uh, without thinking, you know, could, could these be missense mutations? <laughs> like could one change trigger one of these? Find if you can too. So start with the real question and then do the bonus practice. I'm actually interested in that one. Good at it, personal experience. Not aimed at you, right? We also have to deal with, kind of like I said, with the enzyme active site. If we change one of these out, for an amino acid that like kind of looks like it, it's probably still going to be okay. Similarly, you're not going to blow up the three D structure if you keep something that's very similar. It might just stay the same, or at least close to the same. That's okay. Some of these are devastating, though. Or no, sorry, one of these is devastating. When you think you're close. Kind of try and confirm it with anybody next to you. Bonus question. This is auto practice set. By the way, that's why it has a little new next to it, but I wanted to call attention. Um, try the bonus practice too, eventually, to see like which codons each of these could be and could they change to one of the others. I'm actually interested in that. But otherwise, for the love of God, put your name on this thing and bring it up here. Because I think I'm going to start doing this a little more often because that's what was kind of in the survey is like, we like the practice time in class. So let's make that a bigger thing. I also was going to schedule writing today, but there was mercy in my heart. So we're not going to do it. Study for the exam and enjoy your spring break like ramped back. All right. You guys are good. Turn these in up in front of me.